Julien, you are um, a professor at Karolinska Institute and you are a member of the Nobel Committee in Physiology or Medicine. You have previously been chair of that committee. And of course, you um, are a member of the assembly, which is the body that decides who receives the prize in physiology or medicine. But this is the kind of um, deep knowledge of the prize that most people don't share. So could you tell us, place us, um, tell us who it is that actually decides who gets the prize in physiology or medicine? All right, so um, that's very clear from Alfred Nobel's will. And it, the Karolinska Institute is the awarding body for the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. And it used to be all of the professors at Karolinska Institute participated in, you know, they were the jury. And you know, some years ago, um, the assembly was created and that was now reduced to 50 members. So 50 professors at the Karolinska Institute are the jury for the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Thank you. And that's not so different from chemistry or physics where it's a different institution, but again, there's a body of professors who make a decision. Right. In that case, that would be the Royal Swedish Academy. And in fact, I'm also a member of the Royal Swedish Academy, so I'm voting for the Nobel Prize in chemistry, physics and economics as well. <laughs> That's quite a responsibility on your shoulders, but it's uh, it's um it, it's good to it's good to place you as one among, one among many, and I know you were keen to do that at the start of the conversation because yes. speaking I mean exactly so Pride. I'm one amongst right I'm one amongst many, so I have forty nine other colleagues that are all engaged in the work of the Nobel Assembly and taking that enormous decision every year. And we are represented publicly by our general secretary, Professor Thomas Perlman. And so he's usually the voice of the assembly. Um, and in this case, I'm happy to share my thoughts from inside the room with you as a member of the assembly. Yeah, because people who belong to these assemblies or committees or whatever are generally quite circumspect about speaking about it. it I mean, it's, it's interesting that it's not spoken about too much. Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways it's part of the mystique of the whole process because we we don't generally discuss anything related to our deliberations. I was on another jury for another prize and it was in the area of research that I do, diabetes. So it wasn't a Nobel Prize, but it was a diabetes prize. And I was surprised that they talked about the deliberations of the jury. And I was almost shocked because I'm so used to the fact that we never discuss the details and that's kept secret for 50 years. Um, in fact, one doesn't even know the name of the individuals who are nominated for the prize until after 50 years. So theoretically, you should really never know if you were nominated and you certainly should never know if you've been a, in the running for the award. Well, we're not planning to make you reveal any secrets now, but this is a chance to explore the way that the uh, Nobel Prize is thought about and uh, decided the effects of the prize. Um, I think it's going to, I'm, I'm fascinated to learn what you have to say. So, um, and I hope the audience will uh, stay with us and join me in that fascination. So you mentioned the nomination and that's where it all starts. So let's begin with that. Um, you have to be nominated to receive the Nobel Prize. Who in the case of physiology or medicine is entitled to nominate. All right, so every year, I think about November, December, we start to send out invitations to members of different academies, previous laureates, um, deans of medical colleges, and faculty around the world. And an invitation appears. It used to be in an envelope and you'd get it in the mail, but now we are working in the digital age. And so these come out as, um, an uh, email. And in fact, I, I, a colleague that I know sent me a mail and said, this is legit. You know, this individual said, do, do, am I really getting invited to nominate a candidate? And I said, yeah, that's a real email. So, so it, <laughs> sometimes people think it's spam, but it's not. And um, the deadline for the nominations is at the end of January. And so what we're looking for is the nom nominator to, uh, select no more than three individuals for a discovery. 
And so we ask individuals to identify one to three individuals and we ask in the nomination form that the discovery is, um, you know, revealed to us. What is the discovery? And it's just a sentence, you know, for the discovery of X, Y, or Z. And it's not a lifetime achievement award. And sometimes people are confused about that because sometimes the nominations will be for the whole body of work of this individual. And that's not what we're looking for because Nobel was very specific in his will that we are to award a discovery. And that's that's basically it. And so, you know, theoretically you could have done, you know, one experiment. And if you discovered something that could fit the criteria of a Nobel prize. And so the next thing we're looking for is a short paragraph of what is the discovery. So we would like the nominator to put in a few sentences on what they think the nominated candidates did for the discovery that they feel should be awarded the Nobel Prize. And now that we've gone, um, we used to get about maybe 400, 400 nominations a year, 500 or so, and now we've got double that. So we've got almost a thousand nominations a year and every year we have about 25% of the nominations are candidates we've never, we've never evaluated before. So they're newly nominated candidates. But the large majority of the nominated candidates are previously nominated candidates. Um, and one has to be nominated in the year to be considered for the prize. And every year we start over. So if a candidate was nominated in 2009, but they're not nominated in 2021, we wouldn't consider that candidate because they weren't nominated this year. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially that's what you look for. And you cannot do a self nominate nomination. So you can't nominate yourself. And um, so clearly it should be what a discovery. And, and sometimes that doesn't happen in the letters that we get. There are other things. Mm -hmm. Well, several strands to pick up on that. One thing is that this is, you've already mentioned Nobel's will twice. And yes, it, it, he specifies, in fact, for each prize, each of the five prizes, and now of course there was economics, there's economics as well, so there are now six prizes, but for each of the prizes, he specified what it should be, a, a discovery or a discovery, an invention or what, you know, different phrasing. And you've stuck very closely to that, to that original phrasing. It's interesting that the will is so dominant in dictating the, the, the action still, 120 years later after the beginning of the prize. Right, so we can't go after an invention or an improvement. I think chemistry has a, dis everyone has a discovery. Every of the science prizes are all discovery. And chemistry has an improvement and physics has an invention. invention. And we are only yeah. discovery. So that, I would say that limits us <laughs> more than the other prizes were very limited. And what we're looking, right. well, I can, we can get to this as well, but what we're really looking for has to be a discovery. And it should either be a new paradigm or paradigm shifting. Yeah, we, w we definitely will get to that. Thank you. But then on this on this 25% of nominations being new nominations. So I was going to ask, do you think it makes a big difference who you ask to make the nominations? Because is it the case that discoveries that are of the magnitude that people are going to suggest them are so well known that if you just ask a big group of scientists in relevant fields, you're going to get all the relevant people or by going to different groups of people, do you actually end up finding new discoveries that you didn't know about otherwise? Um, it's a hard question to answer because you have to do the, I'm a scientist, so you have to do the experiment. <laughs> but I would, I would, I guess the only thing I can say is that now that we do this electronic um, nomination, we also let the invited individuals who are making the nominations provide three separate nominations, right? So before you'd get one piece of paper and you'd fill it in and send it back, now you actually can nominate up to nine different individuals for three different prizes, okay? And that's why we've gotten, I think, so many more nominations, but we still have about 25% newly nominated candidates. So I don't, I'm not so sure that we're getting many, many, you know, higher percentage of newly nominated candidates, even now that we've expanded the amount of individuals that we're like accepting for nominations. That makes any sense. Mm. No, it makes a lot of sense. I, I, I understand that it's complicated. 
without doing you know, a kind of controlled experiment. But you can probably guess that behind that, my question is this idea of, of, of the diversity of the, of the people who are being nominated, the diversity of science, certainly, and whether fields that are perhaps not expected are suddenly cropping up. And then, of course, gender diversity, and then, of course, global diversity. And whether, whether this shift to electronic and the idea of moving from you can nominate three people to you can nominate three groups of three, is, is all part of this trying to collect a wider group of people to put into the pot. I, I... There's part, yeah, there's part of that. But, I, you know, the other thing I would say is that um, there are many letters sent out and, you know, invitations to nominate, but there's still, um, I can't tell you the percentage, but surprisingly, a lot of people have the opportunity to nominate and they don't take it. And so that is even more surprising to me that a lot of people are very hesitant to nominate. Um, and I don't really understand why that is. So I think we have a really big coverage and there's a lot of people invited, but not everyone who's invited takes the opportunity to nominate a candidate or more. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever asked anybody? We yeah. sent you a letter. Why didn't you, why didn't you give me a... Yeah. You know, I always thought maybe people had a time, hard time settling in on one constellation. I mean, it's not a lot of hard work. I mentioned you have to have three names or no more. And a, pair, a sentence that just says, for the discovery of, and then a short paragraph. So I'm not really sure why people hesitate to nominate candidates. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe they think it's spam, like as you said. Maybe you need to send them, sell, send them a photograph of you in that setting, because it looks so utterly Swedish, the setting you're talking to us from, that I'm sure that it would convince anybody that it's, that it's, the, real, it's the real Mackay. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. so we get... <laughs> So we get to the end of January, and that's the close of nominations. Um, and then you have this big pool. Um, uh, one question that I've always longed to ask, I know that you on the assembly have the power to nominate your, yourselves. You can uh, not nominate yourselves, you can nominate other people. Um, so right. if, there was a candidate, you, if there was a candidate you thought desperately ought to be there, but nobody had nominated them, would you then put them in the pot yourself? Would you say, well, they ought to have been in there in the first place? Yeah, we can do that. And we, we can have a, a, a secretary nomination. So um, our general secretary, Professor Perlman, can, can nominate a candidate. Uh, we wouldn't, I don't know that we do it after the fact, but we might do it in advance. You know? I mean, yeah, of course. Of course. We, we as, as members of the assembly should be nominating candidates as well. And we pay a lot of attention to conflict of interest. So we really, you know, if you have a conflict with a candidate, you're not involved in voting for someone that you have a, a you know, professional relationship or any kind of relationship with. But you, as a member of the assembly, you can nominate candidates as well. So now this process starts of um, uh, looking through the nominations and beginning to um, whittle them down. Uh, to describe that process that lasts between the end of January and the, the day in October when the announcement is made. Right. So you, you mentioned that I was chair of the committee and the committee is a small working body of the assembly. The assembly is 50 members. The committee is a member, a group of five. And every year we can bring in 10 more members, ad hoc members to the committee. And generally they come for the assembly and they um, work with the committee to sort through all these hundreds of nominations. And so I chaired that committee between, um, let's see, 13, 14, 15, those years, 2013, 14, 15. And so that, that, that work of sorting is essentially driven by the chair of the committee. And that is a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And um, you know, you're reading every nomination and um, you can't be on the internet and you can't work in an environment where people are, you know, at my job where people walk in my office while I'm sorting out all the nominations because they can't, they can't see what I'm working on. So, you know, I'm locked up at home and reading the nominations and um, we then meet in March and we start to assign um, the work to the committee. And every candidate is looked at, every nominated candidate is looked at very thoroughly and newly nominated candidates, we will do something called a protocol note because you know we've never seen this individual before. So we'll go and look to see whether or not they've actually, you know, been involved in the work they're nominated for. Have they, you know, is there a discovery? 
And do we want to take this nomination forward? Do we actually want to dig deeper into this nomination? Or is this something that we feel might not rise to the distinction of a Nobel Prize? We start to sort. And then we've had candidates that we've seen before. And so we already have some kind of an opinion about the work that they've been involved in. And, you know, you already know that um, it takes many, many years before people are awarded a Nobel Prize. They have to be nominated that year, but it might be that people have been nominated several years. And so it, we might be working on trying to understand the height of the discovery that they've been nominated for. And so we've got a couple different, you know, kind of different uh, plates in the, you know, balls in the air, you could say, as we're moving through the process. And that's what starts in March. And what we'll do is we'll start to commission different reports on the candidates that we um, are, are uh, interested in, you know, penetrating whether their work rises to the distinction of a Nobel Prize. And from March until, you know, September, pretty much, commissioning reports either uh, internally or externally. And we'll um, even ask people out in the world to give some input into the candidates that are nominated and the discovery. But ultimately, we take the decision. It's not external experts who take the decision. We take the decision based on the reports that we receive. Mm. Yes, it must be awfully complicated because you must have um, you must have particular problems tr that you need to solve. For instance, a piece of work that is where the discovery is clear, but the discoverers are a little opaque, or there are there are too many candidates or competing. Um, stories and sorting through that while remaining secret must be difficult because often you want to talk to people presumably who are close to the candidates to find out what what went on for instance but it must be how, how do you how do you maintain that secrecy so i mean one good rule is that members of the committee and assembly never talk to the research community directly all of that communication is driven by our our secretary um, and, you know, so it's handled that way. Um, and hmm. what we get is input in the form of a written report. So we're not really talking to people. Hmm. You, me you, mentioned the, you mentioned the mystique of it being a good thing, which undoubtedly it is, and it's done wonders for the kind of, um, I suppose, you know, the, the, the status of the prize, which of course rests on the fact that the awards have been to fantastic science, for instance, but but do you think the secrecy is an essential part of it? I mean, can you imagine this process being open? Um, I I'm happy that there is secrecy around it because um, you can work in peace. <laughs> you know, you can. <laughs> um, so uh, it's there's already enough just to read and then to have to deal with sort of an external relationship with other people around it, I think that would be complicated. So I'm quite happy that we can discuss things amongst ourselves, the members of the assembly and the members of the committee, and we can really deeply share what we feel about the work. And, um, and we can do that in a really honest way with each other, which I, I, I like that. And so, you know, we have a, a room that's really interesting. It's on the campus of the Karolinski Institute. And um, the room has got a very large table in the center of it. And around that large, large table are about, you know, 20 chairs or so. And the room holds 50 individuals. So we all sit together in one big room around this circular table. And we really lean in and can really discuss the science. And we'll have, um, something about 15 meetings a year. We have a lot of meetings and there'll be day long meetings where we'll discuss this at great, uh, in great detail. And so the fact that we can have these kinds of scholarly discussions amongst ourselves, I think is a, um, a good thing. Mm. Those meetings must be absolutely fabulous to be part of. And I remember Alf Lindbergh, the uh, former secretary of the, uh, no, the prize in physiology or medicine saying that it was for him the greatest education in physiology in, in, in any any of the teaching he'd ever had to be part of those meetings and to listen to this body of people discuss science. Well, that's for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm a physiologist, but I specialize in diabetes. And, you know, you can just look back on the prizes that were awarded while I was chair. Um, 
they were areas of science that I'm not working in every single day. So you've got to get down and you've got to do a lot of homework. <laughs> you've got to do a lot of reading. But it's it's really fascinating. I, it's a real privilege um, to be a part of the history. And just on a personal level, you really learn a lot. Hmm. And so, I mean, science is in, in, in some ways um, utterly objective, but of course it comes down to humans. And so it must be, especially if you're working with nominations year, year after year that are staying in the pool, it must be difficult to not to become too invested in the discovery that you're working with. You know, you kind of you must start supporting your 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 team for for getting the prize. Does is there a is there an element of that? And is I, it healthy? Well, I don't really. Yeah, I don't ever felt real ownership over the things that I put time into. I mean, in that way, I, I, that is my own experience because I don't really think that it's. I don't feel like you're rooting for your area of science. You know, I've had people at different meetings, you know, where we've presented on the, the Nobel um, work and people will think that, well, you know, this year it's this area of science and next year it's that other area of science because that's how it works. And some people think that we, you know, have a 10 year calendar and we're kind of going you know, this area of biology, this area about, you know, we go off the different disciplines and, and rotate them. And that, that's not what we do at all. And so we really do try to look at what is the you know, um, most compelling, biggest discovery of the year. And it might not be that discovery was made that year, but it's of what we're working with at the time in that year. And so um, my colleague, Klaus Sherry, always says that, and I agree with him on this, every year it's really overwhelming. It's a lot of work. It's very, 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 very difficult in the beginning. But by the end of the year, by October, when we, when we vote, it's pretty easy because we've done a lot of hard work and a lot of discussions and dialogues along the way. So by the time we're voting, that's always the easy part. Fascinating. So what, what are you looking for when you, uh, discovery is a big word, um, what are you looking for when you're actually making the choice? Um, oh, it's probably different um, based on year to year, I could say. I, really, I mean, I, overall, I, really I think it, is, it, it's, it yeah. has to be a discovery. It is a discovery. Yeah. Um, it is a paradigm shift or a new paradigm. Um, the, the benefit to humankind is also something to consider. Um, and uh, sometimes with a real fundamental physiology prizes, people have a hard time seeing the benefit to humankind in that. But I, I guess I never have that problem because all new knowledge, all new knowledge is a benefit to humankind. Um, and so that's, and then, you know, I, you're right. I mean, we, it's, we have perhaps, you know, a half a dozen or so different constellations of things that we're working with. And so some are less clear than others. And, um, it doesn't mean that we completely drop it. It might mean that we say that that's not really completely ready for, we're not sure yet, you know, we haven't uncovered all the stones. And so um, it really would be this, this height of discovery, benefit to humankind, a new paradigm or a paradigm shift. Gosh, it must be so complicated because you, you're, you know, so many variables. And one of the variables you're dealing with is that often people are on the older side when they're being considered because it's taken time for their discoveries to come through the mill and show themselves to be of significance of, of the significance you, that's needed and so you must i don't know i mean it, it, so much to think about one thing one must think about is is whether people are actually going to survive long enough to be awarded uh, the prize if you've got so the question is do we look at the candidates and do an age or health test on them and say oh let's yeah. do a health test and see who's fit and who's not fit we don't actually we don't do that so we don't consider that per se we we really don't um we don't talk about where the candidate is from in the world or uh we don't talk about the sex of the candidate we don't talk about the institution that they're coming from. We don't, we don't talk about that. We only talk about the research that was done, the experiments that the individual made, were there other people that should be considered or not, uh, and how much of a surprise was the work that they were doing? You know, how much of a height of discovery, how much new ground was broke? 
by those discoveries. And all those other factors, we actually don't, we don't discuss in all the years that I've been there. And I, a lot of people ask, you know, well, do you think about where, you know, where the person is coming from, what part of the world they come from, or the diversity issues are really important, but we don't, deli we don't deliberate on the basis of diversity issues. That is in itself very interesting. I mean, it, it, um, there are so many areas of life where there is deliberation about that. And I mean, for instance, in, in Sweden's a good example with the setting of quotas for the number of women on boards of companies. You know, there's a very straight example of where there's a direct intervention to increase diversity. Um, uh, the, you, you don't do that. Um, but there, but there is, a, on the other hand, a lot of pressure to increase diversity um, for yeah, the prize. Oh, absolutely. So how, I mean, how do you tackle it? How do you tackle it? I mean, I think increasing, well, obviously increasing the pool of diversity in the candidates that we're working with, for sure. Um, and, you know, I guess if you look at the assembly, when I came to the assembly, there were four or five, you know, if we talk about the female male diversity, there were only four women on the assembly. And now there's certainly more. And um, our assembly is probably more diverse in terms of its cultural background, because, you know, years ago, it was only Swedish born people that were on the assembly. And now we have a number of members on our assembly who were born elsewhere, but speak Swedish or they, they you know, they're professors at the Karolinska Institute. So even our assembly is more diverse. So, I mean, you know, I, you're you're right about that. It would be nice to be able to take that into greater consideration, diversity per se. But we're the donor has us to look at discovery, and so that's what we mm. do in the first hand. Mm, mm, mm. And again, I mean, I realize these are awfully difficult questions. That I mean, there's two levels of difficulty. One is that they're just difficult straightforwardly, and then there's the element of the, the, the secrecy and the mystique around them. But it's interesting that Klaus Scherer says that, that it's an easy decision at the end. One imagines that you must have a lot of very, very good work kind of waiting in the wings um, and, and that there must, there must be in, more than enough good work to award the prize to. But it sounds as if actually there's about the right level. If it's easy to make the decision, it, it, that's not the case. You're not feeling that, goodness, I wish we had more prizes to give away because there's just so much good work. I wouldn't say it like that. It's just that when you come to make the decision, you feel like you're very well informed and you've turned the stones and you've kind of looked everywhere and you're really satisfied with the investigative work you've done. And so you can rest easy that you're, you know, you've really looked to see whether or not you've uh, made the, the right constellation for example, or the right, you know, the right prize. So in that respect, I think that just says that, you know, we feel like we've put a lot of effort into making the right decision. And then when we've done, we are confident that we've done it. Okay, let's turn to the rule of three. So <laughs> you can give, you can give three people the prize. Um, do you, uh, do you see any need at any point to change that? Or are you very comfortable with, with that number? Um, right now, I, I, I feel comfortable with that number. Um, I know that comes up a lot. Um, there's many other, you know, thoughts about whether it should be three or more or less. But I, I feel like it, it, uh, it hasn't posed great challenges yet. Um, I guess one doesn't really have a crystal ball to see how it's going to look in the future. Um, the other is that I think we can still identify individuals who are, you know, making the discoveries. And even though people work in teams, we can still come down to where we can kind of see who is the definitive, you know, the deletion test. If we took that person out of the equation, if, if that person wasn't there, we can still do that and say, well, this might not, this wouldn't, this wouldn't have happened if this person wouldn't have made this discovery. And um, I think that, you know, down in the future, Obviously, this will be a question that will be discussed. But right now, I think that the rule of three still works. And just 
using your expertise from the uh, Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and the other prizes, uh, more where I suppose, especially in physics, this is discussed a little bit more than in medicine yet. Do you think that a time might come when a team does be, get awarded the prize rather than an individual, as it as it as is the case, for instance, with the Peace Prize? I mean, you you mean a team with many many more than three, right? And I, yeah. I'd come back to sorry, this. I'm we, sorry, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, we have we have we have discussed this, and we're still we're landing on that. We we still are of the opinion that we can identify an individual who has you know through this deletion test who has made the discovery, and you know the future. I don't know yet. You know, I mean, I, I don't have the crystal ball, but right now we're still comfortable with that. We can identify individuals. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, good answer. The, so we come to the day in October when you pick up the telephone and, well, first of all, there's a vote on the very day of the award. So the final oh. vote you take just, just that same morning that you make the announcement, which is cutting yeah, things I mean, super that's, fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, people don't realize we actually don't vote until that first Monday in October. And that's, you know that we have we have a meeting in the morning with the entire assembly and and we we vote and then we are you know under a silence uh, embargo because then professor proman our general secretary will contact the laureates and you know the uh intention is that they should be reached by telephone and I, it's not easy to get their telephone numbers it's not so easy because we don't you know they didn't nominate themselves, somebody else nominated them. And, you know, there's no place on that nomination form for the telephone number of the candidate. <laughs> so, so, I mean, in some cases, you know, you're, you're spending a lot of effort looking for the phone numbers. And I mean, there's one story, um, Jan Lindstein apparently called the wrong candidate on the telephone and got somebody on the phone and, and got the answering machine and called to say, you know, here I'm calling to, inform you you've received the Nobel Prize and he turned out that he called the wrong guy and he had to call the answering machine back again and say hey his Jan Lindstein again and I sorry you, you didn't get the Nobel Prize so you know we we, we don't discuss anything and Professor Perlman contacts the laureates and hopefully he gets them and uh, informs them of our decision and then around 11 30 or so we have a press release and that's where we first tell the world our, our decision um, of you know, the, mm -hmm. the laureates. Mm -hmm. it, it, well, as I say, it is cutting it very fine. And if you if if suddenly in that last meeting you change your mind, then everything has to everything gets put on hold a bit or at least disrupted. But yes, I think it's very interesting. That, uh, and of course the secretary <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean has can you remember a uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not asking for any details, but can you remember an occasion when that vote has surprised you? No, no, no. There's a lot of dialogue between the committee and the assembly. I mean, the committee's job is to put forward a suggestion to the assembly. And then there's sort of an anchoring in of that. And, you know, a, dis a discussion point around that. So when we vote, there's not so many surprises, but things can happen. I mean, you know, mm. I, I I think, you know, one case maybe people might remember is Steinman, Ralph Steinman passed away and he passed away the weekend before we voted. Then we came to vote. And of course, no one knew that Ralph Steinman had passed away. We didn't know that. And in the will, we're not allowed to award a prize to an individual who's passed away. So we had acted in good faith. We came to our meeting Monday morning, you know, nine o'clock in the morning and voted. And it turned out um, Professor Simon passed away. And so that was a bit of a surprise. So I guess, yeah. you know, things things can happen. And um, I know that that was a discussion point with with the, you know, the lawyers and, and the decision was that we had acted in good faith and we took our vote and the decision held, and, and that was I was happy that that decision held. Mm, 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 mm. 
Yes, but it's interesting that yes, so much work has gone into it already that it's unlikely that at the last hurdle anything changes. It reminds me of once when the Large Hadron Collider at CERN released its results, I was a little surprised that everybody seemed to agree with everything that was said as a result of it. And a physicist explained to me, he said, you don't understand physics. So much money has been invested in this thing already that everybody's pretty sure about where we're going to end up. And I suppose it's the same in this process that you've put so much work into it that you're, yeah, you've streamlined. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, where, where, you know, the mysteries are, the, the world doesn't know. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So when that phone call happens, the life of the people who are called turns completely upside down. A wave breaks over them. Um, and you, of course, have had the opportunity to observe this this happening to people over many years. Um, what would you say? Um, I don't know. What would you what would you, what would you say changes in the life of a laureate once once that call has come? This is just my general, you know, a generalized general impression, you know, I mean, you know, in, in my experience, the individuals that receive the award are scientists and university professors, some are retired, but they've been engaged in research and for the large part, they've been private individuals, you know, they're not movie stars, <laughs> they're very private people and um, doing what they love and they have a passion for. And I would say that, you know, they're not working in a way to, it's like an Olympian is very clear about the fact they're gonna to go to the Olympics and they wanna win a gold medal in the Olympics. That's not true for the majority of scientists. There's, you know, millions of scientists around the world and they're just doing things they're passionate about, solving problems and, you know, puzzles. They're working with puzzles, you know? And, and so um, it's interesting that for the most, most of these individuals, they are woken up in the middle of the night or in, out on a you know, hiking trip somewhere on a vacation or in their office teaching. They get a telephone call and many of them have a lot of disbelief. They're like, what? You know, there's, they didn't expect it. And suddenly they become public people. You know, they really are out in the limelight. And, um, and, and it's interesting just to see that transformation. You know, you can search on a person's name before and then one day after, and, and their Google hits are like enormous. And when the candidates come to Stockholm for that lovely week, the celebration of science and culture and humanities when they're in Stockholm, um, you know, it's interesting just to see how that week of um, recognition and um, celebration of their, their many years of efforts is appreciated by the community. And so you kind of see that transformation as well from somebody going from a very private life to a more public life. And so for some people, they embrace that. And for some people, that's tough. You know, it's you suddenly have the spotlight on you and you were just doing your job. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you have suddenly been created as an ambassador for science in a way that you never previously imagined. And again, I know that, um, I know you. I, can, I predict your answer, which is that you don't think about this. But given that you are making these ambassadors when you make those choices, is it really possible not to think about that? You're thinking about, okay, we're going to give the prize to this person, this person, this person. It must be in the back of your minds. Well, we are going to confer this ambassadorship on this person. Surprisingly, we don't think about that. <laughs> we don't think about that. And um, it really is down there. I mean, you know, it's down on the level of the science. We're reading the papers, you know, we're in, we're in the scientific journals, reading the papers, looking at the data and, you know, we're down there on the details. What did they, what did they do? And what, you know, and what was known before that? And, and you know, and we try to figure out who, who is the one that, you know, take that one out of the picture. Would they still have done that experiment or was that, you know, so we're down on that minutia. You know? and that's all this other stuff happens. Um, Okay, well, then with one or two uh, exceptions one can think of, in general, they do make fantastic ambassadors of science. And so is there something about the, is there something about a creative discoverer that also makes them a good ambassador? I suppose there is. 
they're rewarded for something that they're incredibly passionate about. I mean, you know, there's no doubt that these individuals have devoted their whole life to working on something they really care about and in a field that they care about, you know, so they really care about the entire scientific enterprise. And um, many are educators and uh, want to, you know, help, you know, influence the next generation of curious minds. So they want to cultivate that. So in that respect, they are, I think they're good ambassadors because they're, they're nurturing the field um, of science. Um, and they've had, you know, great training. Most of them are very comfortable speaking about their science because they've done that. They've communicated their work. Um, I mean, there are certainly areas that they are not experts on. They like to be comfortable in the area they know something about so they can really talk about the science. I think maybe when you move people out of that comfort zone, people get a little bit more, um, maybe they're not the best ambassador then, but I mean, for the, the science, they're extraordinary ambassadors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I realize, Julene, that we're asking you to talk about, um, I'm asking you to talk about a, a great raft of things associated with the prize, and it's difficult to, to, to encompass everything in one person. But and so, you know, I, I realize this is possibly a hard question, but what do you think that the Nobel Prize is trying to do? By awarding the prize, what are you, what are you seeking to um, achieve? Um, in the context of everything we've talked about, finding in, uh, enormously important seminal discoveries, creating ambassadors, recognizing Alfred no what uh, the intention of Alfred Nobel's will. There's a lot in there, but yeah, I mean now the you know the prize the you know hundred plus years that it's been awarded. I mean they're historical landmarks that have been awarded, and so. I actually do think we we think about that. We think about, you know, how will the prize be perceived? How will this year's prize be perceived in 50 years from now? We think we think about that. So the height of the discoveries are important. Kind of the the, the marking of these historical discoveries and advances. Um, and, and wanting to make sure that we get that and you know, we kind of get that on the board, you know. Um, so I I think that is part of the um, responsibility, you know, um, that the assembly has to make sure we don't miss something. And I'm, you know, I'm sure the assembly has missed things over the years. You know, I mean, people will say that, but we really feel like we don't want to miss big discoveries so that they're there and that they're not that they're in the history books, but that's part of it, you know. Um, I mean, there's, That's interesting. I would say that would be like probably the, one of the big things, you know, I mean, there's things about um, recognizing great science and um, hopefully because people receive the award, they motivate others to go on and, and continue to um, you know, work in areas of scientific discovery and innovation, you know, so there's, there's that aspect of well. Mm. But yes, the, but that telling the story of science through its great discoveries is, is very much part of it. Yeah, I and think so. You, telling I mean, telling the story of science through the discoveries. Yeah, exactly. Mm, mm, mm. And I suppose there is a slightly, I mean, there may, possibly there's a slightly ironical twist that I think people in, think that Nobel in his will was wanting to give a lot of money to creative scientists so that they could just not worry about anything else but focus on being creative scientists. The, the media attention that a new Nobel laureate gets rather distracts from being a scientist and and so they have to learn to focus and get back to it and that sort of thing but but that, that's yeah, just I, mean, I think what... I, I'm sure that was well, I don't I, I can imagine that was his attention I never talked to him so but I imagine at the time <laughs> it would have been that you know because the prize was and yeah, the prize is huge but it's of the amount where you could really work in freedom. You had protected time. You know, you really had the resources to be able to continue to do great things. And I mean, I think in today's world, it might be seen differently. You know, I'm, I'm not so sure that the monetary aspect of this prize is so important. I mean, of course, it's not a bad thing. 
But I think the distinction is much more important. And I don't know that you can put a price on the distinction of the Nobel Prize. And so that I think, and it's part of this history, you know, your bench, you know, you're part of that fabric um, and your work is going to be there as, you know, the seminal discoveries in the field of physiology or medicine, you know, and it's, hmm. so I think that's probably for the laureates, there's that feeling of my work really matters. You know, I've made an impact. Yes, and, and that moment when they sign the book of laureates at the Nobel Foundation and they find themselves signing alongside their own hero and, heroes and heroines of, of, of their discipline, uh, yeah, it, it's clearly, it, it all comes home to them, just what, 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 uh, what they've become part of. Absolutely. I've made you work terribly hard in this hour, and I'm very grateful to you for all the energy you've put into this conversation. Let me finish by asking what advice you might have, if any, for people who are going to be receiving the Nobel Prize. Well, you've seen it happen to a lot of people. Receiving or the people who are in science, because I can actually do that better. So if you are someone <laughs> working in physiology or medicine or probably chemistry and physics, I would say at least for medicine or physiology, I mean, it, you have to make a discovery. I mean, simply you must make a discovery and break new ground or a new paradigm. And you should be prepared to fight dogma because often when you're pushing the boundaries, you might be alone out there. And you know, you're the person that's out there really saying, oh, I have a different way of thinking about this. And you know, you, you prove that with experiments. And I would say that it's there's no requirement to publish in a high impact journal, you know. It really needs to be solid work and it should be published and it should be a discovery. So it's not where you publish the work, it's what you're actually doing. And, you know, train in excellent laboratories. I think that, you know, get the best training you can get and put yourself in environments where you can be around other people that are, are challenging you and pushing you to move your work forward. And I would say your personal background never matters. I mean, it doesn't matter if you come from a wealthy family. Um, it doesn't matter if you've gone to the most prestigious university in the world or not. It, it doesn't matter. It, you know, it, there's kind of no um, limitation for great ideas in your head. So it really is what you've accomplished and what you've done. And then you have to be patient. You really have to be patient because it could take decades, really decades before your work is, um, you know, perceived or it, it reaches a height of a Nobel, a Nobel uh, Prize. And so I think those are a few things to, to put into your kind of in your bag and carry them with you. Hmm. Thank you very much indeed. And, um, and lastly, uh, but the but the question of, of what you would say to a Nobel laureate if you when you I mean, when when that call is made in October and you say congratulations, you've just been awarded the Nobel Prize in physio physiology or medicine. What what single piece of advice would you give to a new laureate at that point? Laureate, um, make sure make sure you have some protected time. Have have somebody who's going to help you and fend off the phone calls. Make sure you get fluids and make sure you have good uh, water <laughs> supply and coffee. Um, that, you know, take a moment and enjoy the pause because it's going to be a very, very busy day. You've got to have a really busy day. <laughs> That's a super moment to end on. Thank you very much. Lovely thought. Thank you very, very much indeed, Julian. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. I'm sure our audience has uh, loved the insights and I'm very grateful to you. Thank you.